Testing, testing, okay. Okay, today's lecture will be taken out of uh, chapter 12 of Boaz and Geller, and that's the section on complex arithmetic, which is the extension of the reals, and we'll go through most of the information that's in here, and we'll be assigning some of the exercises and problems out of this section. Uh, the homework assignment following this. So this begins on page 127 of the postscript file, or PF file, but 119 on the printed file. So what I'd like to do is just sort of discuss historically, again, where the concept of an imaginary number came from. And it's not hard. To, to go back in history uh, to look at this as sort of the progression of a natural progression of, of the concept of what a number is. Oops, I don't that one. So if you take probably the simplest notion of a number, which is the positive integers, and everyone knows intuitively what these are, these are the natural numbers or whole numbers from 1, 2, 3, et cetera. And early on, there was the, the problem of what about 0? Because as we saw in the in earliest lectures, the Babylonians did not have a concept of 0 as either a placeholder or as a number in its own right. So if you Eventually, the idea of zero was formulated, and actually shortly, probably thereafter, the idea of a negative integer, which is closely related to zero, of course. These came in later than the, the positive integers. In fact, for a while, there was even an issue about whether zero or was a number or whether a negative integer really was an admissible number. And they came into being primarily as a result of solving equations. So the necessity of solving equations, for example, you have uh, essentially we would write it now x plus 3 equals 2. Now clearly there's no positive number, which is a solution. So naturally people are not happy with equations that don't have solutions. So they appended negative integers. Now there's also the problem when you have the idea of division. This forces you to extend the natural numbers to the rationals. So for example, if you have 3x equals 2, x equals 2 thirds, we saw, for example, that the Greeks had a very good concept of the rational numbers because they could by similar triangles, construct ratios of integers. So they could multiply integers by integers, and they could divide integers by integers, so they could have the set of rational numbers. Now, I'm not entirely sure what concept of negative numbers they have, but certainly they had the idea of reflection. So the point I want to make is this essentially forces you to come up with a concept of negative numbers, and this equation forces you to come up with a concept of a rational number. So if you look down here, the positive integers, which we start off with just from counting on your fingers or toes or whatever, uh, once you have the idea of zero, you can extend that to the non-negative integers or natural numbers, depending on whether you include zero or not. You then, just for solving equations with 
only addition, you have to extend it by negative integers. And if you want to solve algebraic equations with multiplication, you have to extend the negative integers by uh, rational numbers. Now, the Greeks, again, thought initially that every number was rational. And we, we've talked about this before. They had to extend the rational numbers to the irrational numbers. whenever they considered things like squaring the circle or doubling the cube. So, for example, pi was an irrational number. And they also had to extend the idea of irrationals to transcendental numbers, numbers which could not be constructed with compass and straight edge. So it's, it's, it's sort of clear, then, how to get up to the irrational real numbers. What I want to do is talk a little bit about why the complex numbers came into being. And we all know, for example, if you take a solution which is not linear, if you take an equation, say, x squared plus 1 equals 0, this has no solution in the real numbers. So you essentially have to invent a number x so that x squared equals minus 1, or x is equal to the square root of negative 1. And this number was de de designated by i, of course, for essentially i stands for imaginary, because they were not really convinced that these were real numbers or they're not real numbers, but they did not, we're not even sure that they should exist. Now, the imaginary numbers are essentially defined by this property that i times i equals negative 1. That's the defining property. So we have real numbers like 1, 2, 3, a third, pi, and imaginary numbers. Now, Shortly thereafter, well, not too shortly thereafter, but Gauss, again, it's not surprising he pops into here. There is a uh, very important theorem due to Gauss called the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra, which says that if you have a polynomial equation, every polynomial equation has at least one complex root. And if you divide out these roots and drop the equation, you can sort of recursively turn this into the statement that every polynomial of degree n has n complex roots, possibly. Okay. Now, uh, Louisville's theorem. So Gauss's uh, fundamental theorem of algebra says that, so this is the fundamental theorem of algebra. It basically guarantees that you always have a solution for a polynomial equation, which is nice. So every polynomial equation of degree of degree n bigger than one has at least one root, possibly complex. And at most n distinct roots, right? So, for example, you could have um, z z minus or x minus one to the hundred thousand power equals zero, and that obviously just has one root with multiplicity 100,000. So if you include multiplicity, then every polynomial of degree n has n roots. So if you include multiplicity, repeated roots, in other words, every polynomial of degree n has and roots. Now, you can't include zero because a constant doesn't have, I mean, f of x equals 3 doesn't have a real, I mean, 
does not have a real root. So they exclude that. So you have to have degree n bigger than 1. Okay, so the complex numbers are there to sort of fill in the gaps of being able to solve equations. So we've extended the integers by being able to solve just equations with a single operation plus addition. That forces you, to, by additive inverses, to essentially introduce the negative numbers. Multiplicative inverses force you to really define rational numbers. Being able to solve polynomial equations over the reals forces you to essentially define the rational, I mean the irrational numbers. And whether you can construct all irrational numbers through straight edge and compass leads to the idea of solvability um, over the field of the reals and transcendental numbers. There are numbers like pi that are not solutions of algebraic equations. And finally, if you want to solve equations like quadratics, for example, x squared plus 1 equals 0, this does not have solution over the reals or rationals. Uh, you need to extend it by um, the complex numbers. Now, the complex numbers are formed, of, as we know, as a linear combination of the real and imaginary part. So the complex number is a real part and an imaginary part. Now the real part is typically written as A times I times B. So the real part, this is Z, this is the real part of Z, and this is the imaginary part of Z equals B. Now, one of the great breakthroughs due to Hamilton in the mid-1800s was to recognize that you could also write this as an ordered pair with suitable extension uh, of what it means to multiply. So we know that if we take two complex numbers, a1 plus i, b1, multiplied by a2 plus i times b2, we define this to be A1 times A2, I, B1 times A2, I times A1, B2, plus I squared, which we know what that is, B1, B2. This is real, it's minus B1, B2. So A1, A2 minus B1, B2, that's the real part, times I, B1, A2 plus A1, B2. Now, if you go ahead and write this as a pair, this is A1, A2 minus B1, B2, comma, B1, A2 plus A1, B2. So if you use this, just take this line and this line and use it to be the definition. So just define a new object called, say, z equals a comma b, and you just define multiplication by a1, b1, multiplied by a2, b2, equals this thing, a1, A2 minus B1, B2, comma, B1, A2 plus A1, B2. You can show that this defines all the uh, right properties. For example, it's commutative. You can find the inverse. You can find the length, etc. So this was Hamilton's contribution. he defined a new number by essentially a pair of real numbers. So naturally, Hamilton said, oh, gee, if I can do it with two, is there something called, say, W, which is a triple, A, B, and C? So can I define a commutative algebra system that where I have triples of numbers where I could multiply? Is there a definition? Can we define? addition and multiplication uh, in a way that's consistent. 
meaning that distributor of an associate of properties, etc. Now, it turns out that this is not possible. This is actually exercise 12-33 of Boas and Geller. So this may make it into a future homework assignment. In fact, there's a, a sort of an amusing anecdote that's related that his kids would sort of, uh, at dinner table each night, they would ask him, have you figured out how to multiply triples of numbers yet, Daddy? And he would say no and go off and puzzle about it and everything. And there was sort of a eureka experience story where he was walking across a bridge and it suddenly came to him that you need essentially four numbers, A, B, C, and D. And he invented, essentially, after that realization, the concept of a quaternion, or sometimes they're called hypercomplex numbers. So these quaternions essentially are the extensions of the complex numbers to essentially four dimensions rather than three. So there's no real way to embed triples of numbers in any kind of consistent way, but for four, four tuples you can. And these are what are called quaternions. And Hamilton investigated the properties of these. He was the inventor of those. Now the quaternions, there's a link in here uh, just to show you the, how the quaternions are formed. You can write them in separate ways. You can introduce uh, the sort of three roots of negative one, i, j, and k, with this property, and then write quaternions as a linear combination of one plus these i, j, and k. You can also represent them as two by two matrices or even four by four matrices down here. So in R4, you can write I, J, K, and 1 as 4x4 four four matrices, which have these rules. So we'll talk a little bit about this, because it turns out, interestingly enough, that complex numbers have a very nice interpretation in the plane for planar geometry. So if you look in the complex numbers as in, the, in R2, or in the plane, you can write A plus BI as a, an ordered pair of a real and imaginary part. And then this is the length of the vector Z. And then there's a rotation angle theta. So you can write this as a length times e to the i theta. Now, that's, this formula, e to the i theta, equals cosine theta plus i sine theta, is called Euler's formula. Euler and Gauss get a lot of press in this period of time. And there are several ways of deriving this. Uh, probably one of the easiest ways is by Taylor series. You can, this is, there's a Taylor's series comparison. You can just write it down. Another way of seeing that is that uh, as a system of an ordinary differential equation, that e to the ix, that's f of x, satisfies the following equation. Its first derivative is i e to the i x. And its second derivative is i squared e to the i x, which we know is minus e to the minus i x, which is minus f. So therefore, this satisfies the ordinary differential equation f double prime plus f equals zero. But we know that two solutions of this are sine and cosine. So sine and cosine both satisfy 
this equation. So therefore, because of uniqueness, any, co any solution of this equation must be expressible as a linear combination of sine and cosine. Therefore, f, which is e to the ix, must be some linear combination of sine and cosine. Not necessarily real value. A and B could be complex. So this gives you sort of the Euler's formula right here, and then if you just put in x equals uh, 0, so e to the i0, just using initial values, that's e to the 0, which is 1. This is a cosine 0 plus b sine, that should be sine here, sorry. plus b sine 0. Sine of 0 is 0, a cosine 0 is 1, so that's a, so a equals 1. And the other condition at, say, pi, e to the i pi, if you look at this rotation to an angle, minus 1 is equal to e to the i pi. You put in pi as the initial condition. Probably could also do it with the derivative. You have a cosine a equals 1. a cosine pi plus b sine pi. I guess actually a pi over 2 is probably the one we want. b sine pi over 2. Sine pi over 2 is 1, so this is b. This is 0. And this is just i, so b is equal to i. So you end up a equals 1, b equals i. You end up with Euler's formula. So probably one of the most famous formulas in early, up to the end of the 1700s, was Euler's formula, e to the i x is cosine x plus i sine x. And for a particular case, x equals pi, e to the i pi is cosine pi, which is minus 1 plus i sine pi, which is 0, you get this. So you have the basis of the real number is 1, the basis for the imaginary number is i, the basis for the natural logarithms, and the classic transcendental number pi, both e and pi are both transcendental. So you essentially end up with a relationship between four of the basic quantities in uh, mathematics. So this relates, again, e, pi, i, the negative number, and 1. Or sometimes you'll see it's written e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. So a very nice relationship between sort of the fundamental constants of mathematics. Okay, so it was actually, I've clicked up a little, a little biography of Hamilton there, and I don't know if they have the anecdote in here. So somewhere down there, there's probably that the anecdote. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, I know I read that anecdote somewhere. So the complex numbers do form a field, and a field in mathematics, as you're probably aware, has certain properties or axioms that must hold. So you have two operations, plus and dot, addition and multiplication. Addition and multiplication are both commutative. Addition is associative, as is multiplication. There's a distributive law of multiplication with respect to addition and addition with respect to multiplication. There's an additive identity, a multiplicative identity, and an additive inverse, and a multiplicative inverse. Now, it turns out that the quaternions are not commutative, but the complex arithmetic is, is commutative. 
Okay, so you can extend uh, using this idea here, the positive integers, add zero, add the negatives, add the rational extension, extend it to irrational, extend it to complex, and then finally extend it to quaternions, which are four tuples or ordered pairs of four components. Okay, now there is a geometry of complex numbers, as I alluded to here, because in the plane, uh, these are associated, the angle theta is a rotation. So multiplication by a complex number is essentially a rotation and a scaling. So multiplication is by a complex number is associated with a rotation. In a scaling. So, for example, if you have um, a geometric figure in the plane with vertices, so x1, y1, x2, y2, etc. You can look at these as complex numbers, x2, x1 plus i, y1 is equal to z1, x2 plus i, y2 equals z2, etc. If you wanted to rotate this figure about the origin, all you'd have to do is multiply it by a number e to the i theta. So if I took e to the i theta times z1, it would take z1, wherever that was, and it would then rotate, keeping the length equal, it would then rotate it by an additional angle of theta. So whatever theta value z had, it would rotate it by an additional. So if you wanted to rotate it about its center of mass, then clearly what you would do is you would subtract off this distance, and then it would be essentially around the origin, and then if you rotate it about the origin, it would spin around. So you could actually think of, and this is very fruitful, you could think of two-dimensional computer graphics as essentially all taking complex numbers, multiplying them by other complex numbers, and then resolving them back into the real imaginary parts, plotting them on the plane, you could do rotations, translations, etc., just by complex arithmetic. So scaling, rotation, and translation all is equivalent to complex arithmetic. Or you could also view it as uh, two-dimensional matrices, if you want. Now, it's not surprising, in fact, that three-dimensional rotations or rotations in four dimensions should be accomplished by quaternions. So quaternions, which are these ordered four pairs of numbers, a plus B I plus C J plus D times K. These are associated with rotations, scalings, and translations in three dimensions. Well, actually, in four, but then you just sort of drop out the fourth dimension. So R four. And I just I was doing a little poking around, and I and I found actually Microsoft, if you look at it, has a quaternion package in their DirectX version 9.0 graphics package. So quaternions are actually buried deep inside Microsoft uh, graphics. There's quaternion structure. 
there have been fields is actually fields in the sense of the C++ methods and properties. So you can, there's a W, X, Y, and Z, so there's four components. Then there's a method you can add, and then there's some other dot, invert, length, etc., square root, multiply, etc. And then there's properties of the quaternions. There's the identity and zero. These are various things that are built into that. Apparently, uh, the idea of using quaternions in computer graphics has generated a fair amount of, how should I say, controversy. So this article that's on, on the Game Developers Network, it says in here, uh, this has been without question the most controversial article that they've ever posted. So um, this person basically said, well, why the heck do you need quaternions? They're just this mathematical oddity. Uh, actually, she has some interesting statements in here. What is this? Uh, for example, one statement here it says, <laughs> software engineers in general are not mathematicians. They can code an algorithm but rely on others for a rigorous proof of an algorithm's suitability for a task. In this case, quaternions have been shown to effectively solve problems of 3D rotation and interpolation. But why hasn't anybody looked at them for a simpler solution to now? Perhaps they have. Quaternions lend themselves well to graduate projects and to technical theses. They're very complicated, so describing them or defending them can take many words and many pages of formulas. Vectors are simple. Uh, not much new you can say about vector operations in three. Quaternions are popular buzzword. They sound cool, blah, blah. So her, uh, she's definitely not uh, in favor of quaternions. So if you go back up and look at the news group thread, I mean, it's just page after page after page, back and forth, like this person's an idiot, you know, <laughs> how some of these computer news groups can go here. Uh, uh, so unfortunately, I find her thing to be inaccurate and misrepresentative on several accounts. She's welcome to her own opinion, blah, 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 blah. So um, it's, I just put that out as an indication that uh, some people have quite the, uh, uh, everyone has an opinion on this. So quaternions for use in computer graphics are that's what I say. There are some advantages, and they actually go through that if you go through this whole discussion, her article, et cetera. Now, there was a, at least one link to quaternions that I had found. So this is a link that I've, I've found to quaternions.com. Um, if you look at the PDF file, it's, oh, I don't know. How long is that? how long it takes to pop up here. So here's one of the most concise references. I'll add it to the link at the bottom of the page uh, after class. This is one of the most concise references, and it's actually fairly well cited. I'm using quaternions to represent geometric rotation. So this is a set of notes that came out of course at Berkeley. It starts off with quaternions as a Generalization of the complex numbers, which is square root of minus one. And then if you go ahead and define other roots of minus one, so suppose you have three different numbers that are square root of minus one with these properties, then you can define the transpose, the length, uh, the inverse, etc. And so this actually represents the rotations uh, using their uh, the properties of multiplication. And then there's actually there's having more mathematically inclined uh, explanation of that. And then finally, probably the easiest way to think of them are four by four matrices. 
because it's clear when you have matrices why you can end up with a non-commutative uh, um, product. Okay, and these are just the technical details. Okay, so I think what I'd like to do next time is just finish up the a uh, couple of the topics that I've defined here. I want to go through a little bit more on using complex numbers to do rotations in two dimensions and quaternions to do uh, graphics operations, rotation scalings and translations in three dimensions and four dimensions. And then I'd like to also uh, go over a little bit more of Boas and Geller's chapter 12 and work through some of the exercises and uh, homework assignments there. So this probably will only last for about two lectures, and then we'll have a set of homework. Um, what I would like to do is probably sometime today or tomorrow, I'll come up when I get a chance to come up with some problems having to do with max and min and optimization, finding max of functions, minimum functions, things like that, minimum of integrals, et cetera. So uh, look at the website uh, later on, today or tomorrow, there should be some problems uh, having to do with this section. Also, one uh, quick thing, I did uh, a little bit of revising of the website, and there are now four sets of problems. There are homework problems, there are hard problems, there are unsolved problems, and then now there's the category unsolvable problems. So we have Unsolvable problems, as you can guess, are things like uh, trisecting an angle with compass and straight head, solving a general quintic polynomial equation for roots, etc. Unsolved problems are essentially open problems, like the Goldbox conjecture. Hard problems are things like traveling salesmen or other algorithmically complex problems. And homework problems are presumably easier than those three, because that's what you'll be assigned shor shortly.